Our second idea model, called the L for all problem, is a little more complicated than the prisoner's dilemma and was designed to illustrate ideas about self-organization and cooperation in economics. This model was constructed in order to display some of the flaws in some assumptions made by traditional economics research, namely that economic agents are perfectly rational, self-interested individuals who have complete knowledge of one another's strategies and can do perfect deductive reasoning. Of course, economists don't believe this is true of agents, but these assumptions actually make mathematics possible to do on economic problems. And the result is the notion of efficiency. That is, that in some sense, the agents working collectively, even though they're self-interested, can lead to a situation that's the best possible situation for all. This notion was first proposed by Adam Smith back in the 1700s, and it's come to be called the invisible hand. Adam Smith, in 1776, in his book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, stated this famous quotation, every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Nor is it always the worst for society that it was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. I have never known much good done by those who have affected to trade for the public good. This is one of the first statements by an economist that gets at the notion of emergence. That is, this notion that some invisible hand, that is the collective action of selfish individuals, gives rise to an unexpected phenomenon, which is in this case, according to Adam Smith, the annual revenue of society. There's been a lot of controversy about these ideas throughout the ages. The part that we're going to address here is those traditional economic assumptions of complete rationality and the ability for deductive reasoning that's assumed on the part of economic agents. These assumptions have been questioned, particularly in a relatively new uh, approach to economics that's been called complexity economics that's come out of a number of meetings starting at the Santa Fe Institute. One of the first meetings there involved collaborations between physicists and economists and led to a series of books called The Economy as an Evolving Complex System. This is number one and there's also number two and three and some other volumes related to these efforts. The idea of complexity economics is that agents are self-interested but they have bounded rationality, which means that their reasoning isn't necessarily always perfectly logical. They have limited knowledge of one another's strategies, perhaps no knowledge at all. And each agent does primarily inductive rather than deductive reasoning. Finally, and very importantly, agents adapt over time to an ever-changing environment. In summary, the approach of traditional economics is to be able to make predictions using analytic or mathematical models, assuming what's called equilibrium dynamics, where the environment is relatively static. Whereas complexity economics acknowledges that analytic models are not always possible, that equilibrium conditions are never reached in the real world, and often What's needed are agent-based models where the agents are able to adapt. One of the founders of complexity economics is an Irish mathematician and economist named Brian Arthur, who worked at the Santa Fe Institute for many years and proposed the so-called El Farol problem, which takes its name from one of his favorite bars called El Farol, on Canyon Road in Santa Fe. 
This bar became the subject of a very famous paper that Brian Arthur wrote called Inductive Reasoning and Bounded Rationality. I've put a link to that paper on our course materials page. And that spawned many other papers and many research efforts that used this idea model, including a paper by John Casti that refers to the L for all problem as the most important problem in complex systems theory. I don't know if that's true, but it certainly had a great influence on discussion about many of these issues. So here's the problem. El Farol had a very popular live Irish music night every Thursday night. And in the formulation told by Brian Arthur, about 60 people fit comfortably inside where the music was. But there were 100 people who wanted to go. But those people want to fit comfortably. So they only want to go if 60 or less are going to go. However, there's a problem. These people can't communicate with each other. So that's part of the model. So we have these 100 independent people who want to go, but they only want to go if 60 or less people are going to go. And the only information that each person has is some historical data, that is, they know how many people attended on each of the last, say, M Thursdays, where everyone's using the same value of M, and M stands for memory. This is the memory that people have. For example, if M is 3, you might have the following information that three weeks ago, 35 people attended. That was a pretty good night. Two weeks ago, however, 76 people attended, and it was awful, crowded in there, not enjoyable for people. And then one week ago, 20 people attended, virtually empty. So that's the kind of information that each agent has in this problem. And each person on every Thursday night has to independently make a decision, should I go? So the question is, how is it that all these people can cooperate, in a sense, without communicating and without any rational deductive reasoning? This model, of course, is a metaphor for many kinds of cooperation problems that occur in economics and other social sciences, which is why it's been so influential. There's many different versions of this, but I'm going to talk about the model that is in the NetLogo models library. I put a slightly modified version of it on our course materials page, which I'll show you in a minute. So let's talk about how the model works. Here's how a person decides whether or not to go. In our model, we have 100 people. Each person has some number of strategies. We'll call it N. And a strategy is a way of using information from past Thursdays to predict the attendance this Thursday. So each person has a possibly different set of strategies. For example, let's suppose N equals 3. Each person has three strategies, and your strategies might be these. First one might predict that attendance will be the same as last week. Strategy two might predict that attendance will be 100 minus the attendance last week. Strategy three might predict that attendance will be 0.2 times the attendance of last week, plus 0.1 times the attendance two weeks ago, and so on. You can make any number of strategies like this. And some of them will be very bad at predicting, and possibly some of them will be good at predicting. An important point, though, is that the environment might change, and so the strategy that is best at predicting might change also. And so the agents have to be able to adapt. Each time step of the model corresponds to a new week, a new Thursday, on which you must decide whether you're going to go or not. And here's how you do that. First, you determine which one of your strategies is the current best, and that means the one that did the best job of predicting the actual attendance that you saw on the previous Thursdays. So once you do that, you use your current best strategy to predict the attendance for this Thursday. If it predicts more than 60, you don't go. If it predicts 60 or less, you do go. While you're doing this, all other people in the model are also doing the same thing simultaneously and independently with no communication. Okay, so this is a little bit of a complicated model. 
So I'm going to have you take a short quiz to make sure that you understand it. And then we'll go over the answers to the quiz. And then we'll go through some of the more detailed parts. And the more detailed parts are going to be optional for you to watch.